You start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I guess the nature, I, I'm not sure I would call this collaboration. I, I kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I had a single meeting with Jen prior a to you <laughs> and just tried to give her a little bit of context, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so I work in a laboratory, and uh, the video, was, uh, the film's obviously very interesting in kind of like uh, the labor and the activities that go on in the laboratory. So that was, that was kind of one facet of our conversation initially. Um, we also talked a bit about the technology itself. So I, I do, um, uh, I've done a number of different things, uh, worked in several different laboratories, but um, so I basically do kind of data science um, where my data set is genomes. And uh, another kind of aspect of the work that I do is uh, gene editing, um, kind of writing programs to figure out what what edits to make using, um, you know, now using CRISPR. And we do this in human cells in order to um, develop uh, therapies for, uh, for cancer, leukemia in particular, which is coincidentally mentioned in mm -hmm. Um So we talked a little bit about inserting messages into genomes, um, into uh, kind of synthetic meat. We talked about synthetic meat in general, and I, I don't think we should maybe kind of preface. Uh, you, you said we would hold up till later to talk sure. about synthetic meat, so maybe you want to take, take that off <laughs> and give, give a little background of why we're talking about synthetic meat. Sure. Um, well, I, I do also <coughs> want to say um, that not a collaboration, it's true. <laughs> but but uh, speaking to you was really instrumental at a really early stage because I think definitely as an artist, not one who uh, had uh, previously really worked in science, uh, not to even say <coughs> biology, right? Um, I was totally flying blind. Uh, and a mutual friend of ours uh, put us in touch so that I could actually um, have someone who was informed about uh, the science to actually try ideas out on. So I remember our first meeting, I was like, what about this? And you were like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, so there was a lot of that kind of back and forth. Um, so it was really helpful. And then over these uh, intervening, I mean, it's been probably about a year, more than a year even, right? Um, so in the intervening year, I've, I've learned a lot, but I'm still learning. Um, and so much. Some, What's that? You're doing some lab work. Yeah, we're actually doing uh, lab work right now. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be meeting with you in the future and checking <laughs> ideas <laughs> with you <laughs> ongoing and forever. Um, but yeah, so uh, to the synthetic meat. Um, the synthetic meat itself is a kind of um, it's a kind of shell, right? It's a speculative shell. Um, it exists right now uh, as a method, which I'll go into in a little bit. But it. Um, doesn't really exist in real life. It's in development as we speak. So it's true, but not uh, embodied. Okay. So uh, the science itself is uh, synthetic hamburgers. Um, and uh, the reason why I was interested in this is some of you guys who are more familiar with like uh, older, uh, <laughs> older aspects uh, of my uh, of sort of uh, practice knows that uh, I've been interested in meat for a while. Um, so I've done, uh, in addition to uh, doing research around, um, let's say for this piece in particular, or this project in particular, uh, meeting with NGOs and labor activists in China, I've also met with a lot of um, food uh, factory production sites, uh, agricultural students and scholars. Um, and uh, one thing that I spoke about a couple of years ago that really struck me, struck me when I was talking to one of the uh, agricultural uh, scholars was that uh, essentially uh, 
much of China has hit its kind of um, uh, resource ceiling, you know, resource capacity. Like you can't, and especially in terms of meat and in particular beef, right? Which is the kind of like, um, you know, whatever, it's a booming beef market. Um, but uh, there's no more arable land to give to more cows. There's no land to uh, grow whatever it is they need to eat. Uh, so it's done. And this was back in 2016, 2015, right? 2016. Um, and I was shocked. I couldn't believe that, uh, you know, that we had already hit the wall. So, uh, I was thinking, well, I was thinking a lot about meat back then, and I was like, oh, well, um, what is a solution out of this, right? What's some kind of way that we could think of through this uh, un essentially unsolvable problem, right? There's no true solution, and this extends to many of these, uh, all the stuff around the labor as well, and I would argue actually for Shin Shin, right? What do we do when we think about unsolvable problems? Problems. How do we talk about it? Um, and as artists, how do we explore it? How do we complicate it? Um, so I was like, well, if you wanted to take it really simply, uh, maybe a solution to the resource ceiling is that uh, one could really invest in synthetic meat. Right? And synthetic meat, this uh, technology in particular, is stem cell based. So they take the stem cells of cows uh, grow them, exercise them, and then turn them into burgers. Um, and it's purported, uh, PETA, PETA is a big uh, proponent of this technology because you can still have meat, but without supposedly the suffering. Right? It's meat without a being or without consciousness. Um, so, you know, there's so much uh, talk and not to say panic, around uh, genetic engineering in Asia, particularly China. So I was like, well, if this was a speculative uh, process that really took off in terms of uh, mass scalability, right? Why not China? It's the perfect situation, right? And then, so if that's established as a quote unquote solution, then what can you do with that solution? What other solutions could this solution provide? Right? So. Uh, the solution, perhaps, uh, that I could provide, which starts this project, um, is the idea that um, with the workflow of a stem cell-based mass production, there would be so many times uh, that this, the culture itself would have to be, and correct my language if <laughs> I'm getting it right, that the, col the culture would need to be checked at so many stages of production for pathogens, for every, anything, to make sure that things weren't going askew, because you can't tell. We, there's no cow, right? You can't, you can't tell that it's ill, right? So you have to keep on checking it and checking it and checking it and checking it. And you have to have these uh, workers that are empowered, if not with the, the knowledge, then at least with the tools to check it and check it and check it and check it. But within, when you're checking it, uh, genetically, repeatedly, that actually creates possible openings for uh, manipulating said code. So that's where the spark comes. Well, if you are going to be checking it all the time, you have all this gen access to the, to the genetic code, why not use it as a carrier for messages or, uh, more specifically, as a kind of alternative network to a completely clamped down social media that has consistently been used by the government to shut down large-scale, uh, broad-based uh, protests. Okay. Now, uh, we're still talking about secret messages. Obviously, this is not true secret messages, right? You can't, I can't make a video, I can't like be like giving a talk about <laughs> secret message mechanisms, right? And truly think that it is secret. Um, so, to some extent, um, the science itself, I, while I take it very seriously, you know, I try to take it seriously, um, it's, a, it's still just a show, right? To actually try to uh, bring to um, public uh, view um, the words and thoughts and materials of the workers themselves. 
Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's the email that I got, which was. <laughs> <laughs> someone who wants to insert secret messages into DNA, like, can you talk to her? Um, <laughs> and how do you say no to that? <laughs> so, yeah, the, I think one thing that we discussed quite a bit is this kind of like maintenance of uh, a cell line or a culture. Um, also, the um, because it is a synthetic, um, a, a propagated, Organism, um, it you know it comes from a cow, but it has to be maintained in this kind of like liquid culture. What? How does one do that? What is that thing? <laughs> um, how do you grow it into some kind of like matrix muscle type of thing that kind of looks like hamburger? Um, so that was the kind of like nuts and bolts of some of the conversation that we had, and we can talk about that if you want. But we also talked about like scientific labor. And what it, you know, the actual maintenance process, and like what what it looks like in a lab to do these kind of things, um, and that obviously ties in very directly with uh, the commentary that you're uh, you're making about um, the kind of infrastructure and um, and human practices that are involved in like maintaining this mm -hmm. this uh, kind of synthetic system. Um, and I think one of the things that's really striking for me is that you're talking about synthetic meat, but you're really talking about, I mean, and this is like a speculative feature, but it, it's, it's really like the present. You know, that there, yeah. these things are really happening now, and like the food system itself is, is quite synthetic. Um, it, you know, GMOs are obviously kind of the backdrop of this conversation. Yeah. Um, and then the, on the kind of like, um, I guess on the still quasi-speculative side, um, the uh, kind of Chinese scientific community is also playing with um, germline modification of their own mm -hmm. uh, genome. So, and they're doing that in a way that uh, I think a lot of scientists in the U.S. are um, uncomfortable with, to say this. So, yeah. uh, I guess that that's the kind of like conceptual span of, of some of the practices yeah. that are being discussed in, in that form. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, I mean, like, hmm. it's. I think it's good to bring up this kind of question of American scientists versus Chinese scientists because I think that's something that we've talked about quite a bit. And prior to this, is um, trying to think through what is the actual imaginary around these technologies and thinking about how incredibly limited, in fact, they are. Now, there's nothing that I'm going to do that's going to revolutionize any kind of process, any kind of genetic science, like you guys are doing your own thing. But um, I think that um, in terms of a kind of uh, public consciousness about what it's for and what it can do uh, is incredibly limited. Um, and uh, unfortunately, particularly from this side uh, of the uh, this the American side, the Western side, right, uh, plays uh, terribly uh, conveniently into uh, a sort of like cultural paradigms, right? Of the kind of well, I don't I don't need to articulate it to this audience, but I think we understand, right? Um, so, so uh, in some ways, like while uh, in you could say that this project is a way, is a kind of excuse for talking about uh, ongoing present uh, labor issues and how it's actually structured. Um, and it, this is also a way to perhaps pose a question of um, can we actually think larger about what technology is for? Is it only for um, the uh, endless extension of life for those with the capital to afford it? Mm -hmm. Or is it possible that it could be more than that? Is it possible that there could be a kind of grassroots uh, component to it in whatever direction that might be interpreted? Um, yeah. yeah, well I certainly don't Operate in the context of like grassroots science, although it's something that I feel like I, that's an, yeah. another imaginary that I like, often think about. Um, 
Yeah. The so one of the other things that we were kind of discussing was was uh, the genome as, as a medium and like how to um, use that and think about how message passing would work in that scenario, and, and also the kind of like covert nature of trying to tell someone how to decode a message without uh, having that visible. Um, that, in some ways, is kind of what I do on a daily basis, is like try to decode something that I don't really understand what's, what it's saying. Um, the message that it contains is is more of this kind of like functional, it's just a machine that does something and I need to like look at the schematic to see what's going on. Um, but that parallel was like striking to me and, and something that was definitely kind of, um, kind of reformulating the how the genome is used and, and imagined is, is something that I'm very fond of. Yeah. Well, it's funny because it's not like what it. What I'm basically working with, and I'll I'll talk about this in a little bit. What I'm basically working with is like baby genetics. It's like not really, nor not like infants, but like uh, it's like it's beginner level genetics, right? It's like I'm not actually making things come out like a two-headed cow. Like there's none of that stuff. None of that is happening. I'm purely using the cells themselves just to carry data. That's it. It's literally like a message sent uh, through the kind of, you know, uh, battlefields, right? It's this little, the, the cells become little slips of paper. That's it, right? And any scientist can do this, right? There's like all these kind of like, in fact, uh, quasi-corporate kind of like bodies that you just send in and they you give it back. And that's pretty much it. It's like, it's not extremely hard. Um, so, so that. <laughs> <laughs> but but I do want to say, I want to take a moment actually to um, just speak a little bit about um, the relationship between the genetic work and actually what we were seeing. So what I'm working on right now, um, in coordination with another uh, uh, biologist, is uh, the first proposal. So I don't know if you guys, if you guys remember the walking through the nature and the lights go out and the glowing in the dark and la la da da da, right? So uh, what we're working on right now, uh, it, and we're still waiting uh, to receive it back, um, but it's a sequence that actually um, has a GFP. I don't know, correct me if I'm describing it correctly, but it's basically, it's a bioluminescent uh, section, right? It kind of, um, so if you looked under the correct kind of uh, um, microscope, <laughs> huh? light. Yeah. light, yeah, yeah. You can see this little glowing, a uh, green glowing bit. And then uh, after that green, green glowing bit is synthetic DNA, a whole string of synthetic uh, base pairs. Uh, and that actually very, 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 very simply translates through, it, like I, I was like, oh, let's try, let's try to make it as realistic and as simple as possible. So uh, through a very simple, simple mechanism, it translates into uh, a section of Chinese legal code regarding workers' rights. In pinyin, that's it. Now, that has to do with the fact that when I was talking to a lot of the activists, one of the primary problems is that the workers just have no idea what their rights are, and it does not benefit anybody to actually tell them what their rights are, to have them posted, to offer any methods of information giving. So this would actually just be like, like a little, each little, you know, cell is a chunk of just here's your rights. You're not going to find it anywhere else. Can um, we open it up to oh, questions from yeah, the yeah, audience? Absolutely. Sorry, I just want to yeah. be mindful of time. I'm yeah. sure lots of people have lots of questions sure. about all this uh, high level stuff. So, okay. I could start with a question if people are feeling shy. Did I see a hand right here? I have a question. Yes, good. Um, okay. I'm really curious. I'm curious about a few things, but um, I'd really like to know more about the Derby Dervish. 
I can never say her name. Tia Lee Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but I think first, um, because when we were speaking, I understood this video, like I had a new perspective on it when you said a couple of things where, um, like when I've talked about the video before, I've talked about it in relation to like what you said about PETA, right? Like, so the idea of synthetic meat is um, mm -hmm. that the meat doesn't have sentience. It's like, it's not a living animal, so it's okay to do the matter or whatever. But there's no kind of human rights aspect to like what these shifts in labor do to the workers, right? Which is something that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, so something you said, which was interesting, and I'd be interested to hear more about the science of this, is that not only are these secret messages that are educational and potentially foment yeah. or like sure. distribute messages in the outside world. How, so like how I talked about the film is actually to um, liken it to some of the cases of organizing against Zara that happened mm -hmm. last year, which one was I think there was like um, a factory that shut down overnight in India, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so the workers sewed in messages into the garments but that they had not been paid for their labor. So that was right before um, this woman I believe she purchased a dress in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and she wore this dress to work the next day, and she got this crazy rush, mm -hmm. and she then went to the bathroom and found that there was, what she thought was the zipper was scratching her, was a, um, a mouse paw, and the worker had sewn in a mouse. And so it was this kind of biopolitical resistance that I think that you're arguing for. <laughs> That's disgusting. It, 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 it created a lot of attention. <laughs> um, but I think what you said about the genetic code and the alt, because like the reason the workers have access, right, is that mm -hmm. they have to check it, quality control and safety for the meat requires mm -hmm. its consistency. Yep. So the fact that you're changing this code is actually potentially making the consumer sick. Yep. So in some way I see that as analogous to the, the rash. Or like, mm -hmm. you know, so this idea of what it creates, like how you create consciousness about these conditions. Sure. Um, so that kind of, you know, this, in this speculative fiction of like how you're messaging at words. I'm curious about that a little bit. <laughs> wow, okay, there's a lot there. Um, so, one, so the quality control aspect of this, I think, do, is, um, uh, is a pretty fascinating one. And there, there's kind of this like undertone of like purity that, that comes up. And like maintenance of this, this like completely synthetic thing that has no, you know, I, I think when you eat an apple, you, you're you're kind of triangulating like how that is gonna, you know, act in your body because like it has some kind of natural, you know, consistency or whatever. This is not a natural object. It's even abstracted in some way. So the the, even the notion of like health in that context is, is kind of um, hard to, to really determine. Um, explicitly making people sick in that uh, in that context is, is certainly one way that you can get people's attention. Um, we talked about a couple different ways that you could kind yeah. of you know manifest things or make things visible. I mean, one, one thing about DNA is hard to see, right? So. Um, you know, there's kind of specialized equipment that you need and all of this, but the separate is, is a nice kind of feature, has a nice feature where you shine a light on it and like macroscopically, like in, you know, we could visibly see that there's something there. So um, that's a, a, a nice like, reporter that translates from this microscopic to the mac macroscopic environment. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what I'd like to add to that too is um, this: the question of a biohazard, right, has definitely come up, um, and in particular, uh, I'll be working uh, very soon, actually, on the third proposal, which is the gold balls biolinguistics, right? Uh, and the funding body uh, for that was definitely like, how are you going to deal with the biohazard aspects of this project? And you know, it was. I knew just enough to be like, mm. <laughs> there is no biohazard. There really isn't. It's very, it would, it would take so much effort, so much work uh, to make something actually biohazardous from the end that I'm operating on, right? Um, because 
uh, there's many reasons for this, which you could certainly be more detailed about. But basically, um, I, there's a section in the video itself where it talks about the dark genome, right? That's simply a way to say that uh, a lot of what is in the, our genome or any uh, being's genome and uh, how it actually expresses, right? So it turns hair black or white or whatever, um, is very, very largely unknown. Uh, and it, there's only little sections that correlate uh, <coughs> to various effects that people are still seeming, again, correct me if I'm mischaracterizing, but are basically fumbling in the dark, right? It's a lot of chance encounters, a lot of uh, happy accidents, a lot of this and that, right? So our idea of what it is people can design, how they understand what they're designing actually like is not true. We're, uh, uh, the cultural idea of what we can do is so science fiction compared to what is actually true, which is so not science fiction. It's like very low key related to that. Um, so, um, so it'll be a very uh, far date before somebody would be able to take genetic a chunk of genetics and make it that uh, immediately physical like a kind of rash giving mouse or whatever. <laughs> like that's something that's immediately like this. Like it's, 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 uh, it's um, kind of expressed itself uh, massively physical on a large scale, right? Which is what you're talking about. Yeah, but we are pretty, yeah. still pretty far from in vitro meat being sick to consume, or I actually don't know. In vitro meat? Hmm? Reach our meat? Yeah. Which is the speculative. No. It's safe to eat, but it's really expensive. That's okay. Yeah. So it's the it's production. Been yeah. Made. It's just. It's been made. It's not. Uh, it's not mass scalable. But you're arguing then that with what has been made, what, if you were to enter in those kinds of the, the, the seeder shift from encryption, that it wouldn't. It wouldn't shift the quality of the meat substantially. Uh, for consumption. No. I mean, yeah. No. It's kind of more of a gesture that like this can be done. Yeah. 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 Executing that. But this is the key. This is why it would operate very like well as a secret message, right? Because it would still look exactly the same. It just looks like meat, like synthetic meat. Like weird muscle structure, but you know, as does all synthetic meat. But inside, deep inside its kind of uh, non visible fabric is all this information. Yeah, I guess that I can then be mined. My question was a little bit about like yeah. how the message gets out. Is it for the workers, or yes, is it a consciousness indeed. raising that happens in an embodied way, or mm -hmm. is it a like so? There's a luminescent marker, which mm -hmm. you knows how that shows up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, very small. Yeah, one kind of note about genetic modification that I think is uh, kind of just how I come at it, um, like agricultural is genetic modification, and um, it's actually like a very powerful technique for genetic modification, um, kind of selective breeding, uh, explicitly modifying and, and um, inserting DNA from another context or another or a synthetic context is is obviously like a more intentional mechanism for doing that. Um, but I, I guess just in terms of like. The, the scale of like actions that can be done on a genome. You, you know, you're talking about like how how much like damage can you do in a in a lab. Um, you can you can intend to do a lot of damage, and then you, you know if you have the right tools and technology, but it, you know, it takes like a lot of work to get there. Um, but agriculture, you can. You can make a modification, and you can do a lot of damage, you know, yeah. with the with the monoculture. So th the way that like small changes are uh, are kind of manifest in on that kind of scale makes makes a big difference. Another question, Nada. 
I have time for one or two more questions. Um, well, since someone's jumping, because I do want to tie it back to the first video we saw. It seems like ages ago. Um, <laughs> no, it's wonderful to have this long conversation about both of these really dense, I think, works. And Jen and I were talking a little bit before uh, everyone else got here about what we thought were the connections we saw and what drew us to putting these two videos together. And I was struggling for a word, um, but there was something, a word in your second video uh, jumped out at me as exactly the, the connection between them, which was exploitation. So exploitation of labor, exploitation of women, exploitation of sexuality, um, exploitation of capital and, and you know, workforce. Uh, so I was wondering if that was something that you also saw, and maybe if you could elaborate more on what you saw as a connection. And Sam, please jump in as well, uh, but what your impressions were of, of uh, attention to work. The thing I really admire about that piece, um, and which is why I really wanted uh, to experiment and see how they looked next to each other, um, was uh, what something is supposed to look like and feel like when it is about exploitation. Um, what are the kind of feelings as an audience? Uh, what, are, what are the kind of feelings uh, we should have when we're talking about that? Should it be easy? Should it be uh, easy anger? Should it be complicated anger? Should it be confusion? Could it, should it be uh, self-implication then leading to something even deeper than confusion? Right? Um, what should art about exploitation feel like, sound like? What sources should it look to? And what should it give and what should it withhold? Um, and that is really why um, I was really interested in that work. And I, we're approaching it from such different perspectives, but I hope that um, that level of complication is something that I can do too. Or at least I, it's something that I aspire to. Mm -hmm. One last question from the audience. Sure. Um, can you just speak a little bit more of the sci-fi too? Because this part of the video has like a very sci-fi aesthetic and this even, like it starts with some body part, with some motion that trigger like a, some some objects coming in and throughout this body. This, but then you talk about how technology is not really as sci-fi as they see in some medium. Like, what, what sort of thing? Is it? Sure, um, I can totally talk about that generally. But if there's a particular section to start me out with. Uh, that you're thinking about, I would love to know. Well, just, just like a, almost like CGI, like landscape, almost like game. Yeah. With the, the really dark stuff or the, the waves with all the stuff flying in? The waves and then the, the stuff waves. flying in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, uh, sci fi. Um, for me, I'm gonna just uh, approach it from this idea of like CGI in relationship to sci-fi because I think sci-fi is like such a big thing and then it means such a weird thing now too with all the sci-fi and the superhero stuff out there right now. Um, but I think that um, for me, um, speculative, the speculative, the sci-fi and uh, 3D animation actually are ways of imagining things that I'm not having a good time finding analogs for in the real world. Like it speaks to something that is true, but I can't find uh, the uh, thing in the world that speaks to it right, or speaks to it correctly in the way that I want it to. So then I have to create something else. 
and it is a fabrication and at the same time I hope that it actually gets to something that's um, complicated that is true but it's not something that um, is easily uh, is easy, easily visualized. Yeah. Um, the question about uh, sure. the use of humor. Sure. Yeah. Because I, I noticed that like for both videos, both mm -hmm. artists are very specific mm -hmm. and uh, self-referential mm -hmm. mode of using humor. Like Shen Xin's film um, has this sort of like you know enclosed mm -hmm. self-referentiality, and because I know her a little bit, so I mm -hmm. kind of like get. Yeah, we're just trying to get, like, just pointing at, especially, you know, the part about um, people reading out their responses and trying to teach Buddhism. It, like, so much reminded of the sort of, like, corporate <laughs> appropriation and, like, mass generation or, like, circulation of spirituality, because I've got friends who work in good ways. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, saying that they, that's where they sort of learn their, like, Plus entry into <laughs> Buddhism and spirituality mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. And in your work as well, it seems like a lot of there's a huge emphasis on you know poking fun or like <coughs> jabbing. Um, yeah, so I'm just wondering, like, if, what would you think of that in general, or like the importance of humor? Sure. Like, being funny. Yeah. Like, there's people laugh for that. Um. Mm, not quite. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Uh, humor is really important to me. It's a super. It's very, very important. Um, on the one hand, and I'm sorry, both. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of split it into two, and they're both really kind of cheesy. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, but um, I think that uh, uh, I'm really interested in humor, just as a kind of like greater expansion of a kind of like a emotional uh, and discursive tool, right? Sure. In amongst all the other kind of emotional and discursive tools, right? Like humor is a really compelling one that uh, it's hard to kind of, as an audience member, kind of block against, right? It just kind of lo it just lo 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 Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's a pretty powerful tool um, if it can do that. Um, then on the other hand, I think that uh, we can talk, we can think about what what is humor, how does it work, what are its mechanisms, um, and uh, some people would argue, right, that uh, humor is only funny when it actually strikes a chord, yeah. right? So, um, is something funny when it's totally random and just real? You know, not really, right? So that that's also uh, perhaps in some ways like uh, uh, humor itself can be a kind of sign that something's like touching the nerve correctly, like it's getting to something that's real instead of just random and whimsical, mm -hmm. right? And so in, uh, when I think about Chen Chen's and I think about the humor of, yeah, these people speaking, or it's like the horror humor, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really uncomfortable. Um, but then I also think about people actually sitting in the audience and then they're talking, and then right before that they're seeing video of people like at some kind of like Google, you know, whatever exercise <laughs> thing, like sitting that's there right. and watching, and it's just kind of like, Oh God! Like it's also like what do you yeah. do as audience? Like do I laugh at? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Laugh at and it? how deeply yeah. do I laugh at my own That's implication right. in this whole kind of replication of that kind of like a hyperbolic spiritual kind of um, breakdown yeah. of whatever? Right. Um, it's it's really right on, and the humor is uh, the marker of that. Well, we're just about at nine o'clock, so um, I'm gonna thank you all, and thank you, Jen and Sam. Yeah. sharing with us. <laughs>